and around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Hi, Tim Hi, Carol Masser. Hey, you know what? what? I want to keep talking about Peloton. It's a big story. I agree. I agree. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about it because... That wasn't also... like an exasperated side. Like, it's just... I do wonder where it goes. I, I think it's also a really interesting story. Yeah. And the way the company has uh, changed in just about a year. Right? How quickly yeah. things have changed. Yeah, we're going to talk about it with Kriti Gupta's chart of the day. She's going to take us into it in just a few minutes. Now let's uh, run on over to Charlie Pellet. See what I did there? Yeah, I like it. Okay. Take the treadmill. <laughs> and wait till I tell you how much some of those instructors make. We have got the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all surging right now. 28 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell with the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 347 points up now by 1%. <laughs> Yeah. S&P is up 31, up like. 7 tenths. We've got NASDAQ up 144, up by 1%. Broad-based rally today, gains in cyclicals and small caps, signaling improving investor confidence in the growth outlook amid monetary tightening. Russell 2000 up 1.4%. NASDAQ 100 index up 1%. NASDAQ composite index up 151, up 1.1%. S&P up 8 tenths of 1%. And the Dow up now by 1%. Ten-year yield 1.95%. 10 years down 10 30 seconds. Spot gold up four tenths of 1%, 1827 the ounce. And West Texas intermediate crude oil down 1.9%, 89.56 a barrel. The governors of Connecticut, New Jersey, and Delaware all lifting their requirements that school children wear masks. The LA Times says California will be lifting its indoor mask mandate. Dr. Amish Adalja, senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, he says even though mandates will be dropped, many people will continue to wear masks. It's also important to remember that one-way masking works. So if you're somebody who's very worried about getting COVID-19, maybe because you've had a kidney transplant, you can wear a mask one way and it's going to provide benefit. But that's where we're going. I don't think that, that, that you're going to see ma many of these mask mandates at, at the state level stand for much long. And indeed, many many states, including my own in Pennsylvania, have not had a mask mandate for, for months and months. A Dr. Adalja with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Vaccine stocks, for the most part, lower. Pfizer down 3.2% after earnings this morning. Its German partner, BioNTech, its ADR is now down by 8%. AstraZeneca's ADR is down two-tenths of 1%. Moderna lower now by 4 4.8%. Briefly, Peloton Interactive CEO John Foley stepping down. Shares up now by 25%. Peloton slashing jobs, cutting production plans, but one part of the company is safe. It's famous and famously well-compensated instructors. Last year, sources said senior instructors are paid upward of $500,000 a year. I'm Charlie Pellop. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Can I just say, though, some of those instructors, full disclosure, people know I own a Peloton. Man, they're incredible, Charlie. I'm, I'm I, not I'm exactly a Peloton guy, but no, I'm, I, I'm sure I see you on the weekend as an instructor. <laughs> no, no, not as an <laughs> instructor. Gotta get that side hustle. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Only Bloomberg. All in on Bloomberg. Thank you so much for that My update, pleasure. Charlie Pellet. Well, let's get more on Peloton. Joining us is Kriti Gupta, markets correspondent for Bloomberg. Check out her chart of the day. You can sign up for it at kgupta129 at Bloomberg. Donna. Also check her out on Twitter and Instagram at Kriti Gupta News. You went there, Kriti, early in the morning. You knew the story would be Peloton. Your chart of the day uh, is focused on the company uh, and the shares. Take us into it. Yeah, well, let me just say, do you know how hard it was to find a clever uh, subject line for, for Peloton? Peloton spinning, Peloton kind of circling back, treading back. There's a lot of things you can do there. Uh, but my chart of the day essentially shows the Peloton shares going all the way back to its debut in September of 2019. And really what it shows is essentially a round trip. The idea that they were kind of rising in 2020. Everyone was at home. Everyone was working out. And that was really built into the stock price. And then really in January, of 2021, a complete turnaround. You see the shares just kind of come back down. And before all the gains today, they were uh, below their IPO price at one point. So it kind of tells you that it's not just about Peloton specifically dealing with safety concerns or regulatory concerns or um, even the uh, Sex and City reboot that kind of gave it a bad cameo. It's also about uh, simply the broader kind of pandemic trade and the reopening trade. And I think Peloton is a really great proxy for that. So 
As you look at this stock price, I mean, I think one of the things that Tim and I have been talking about, Creedy, and it's remarkable, is this story. It's not a really old company. I mean, if you think about it, I remember doing just a few years ago, this, you know, sitting it down with John Foley and like, tell me about your company. And it wasn't public yet. <laughs> you know, one of the big questions was, you know, when are you going to IPO? So I, I guess, you know, I wonder what the story would be from Peloton sans pandemic, like if we hadn't gone through it. Um, would it already be acquired? Would it just be a different way we look at it? You know, any of these companies that got the pandemic bump, you know, they've got to go through some kind of correction. And certainly we've seen that with Peloton as a company and Peloton, the share price. Yeah, and I think to your point, you could make the argument about a lot of the kind of pandemic trade companies, right? I think Zoom is another great example. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you actually were to look at Zoom stock, not to stray from Peloton, it actually looks really similar to Peloton, these massive gains in 2020, and then this kind of uh, pairing of those gains, the reversal in 2021, it essentially makes a round trip as well. And I think, to your point, uh, I think the pandemic and this kind of work-from-home era gave a platform to a lot of these companies that perhaps otherwise wouldn't have gotten that bid or perhaps wouldn't have gotten that bid so quickly, I think is a better way to say it. Um, yeah. But you are starting to see the market balance out a little bit. And what's interesting is that these companies are trading back to where they were pre-pandemic, which kind of in some ways tells you uh, some of that kind of insanity that mm -hmm. came from the Fed and the stimulus perhaps that's reversing a little bit. You know, bit. it's like when you got a rug and you take it outside and you shake it and you get some of the dust and stuff out of it. Like, you do <laughs> feel like there's a lot of pandemic plays, right, that you got to kind of shake some of this stuff out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where the takeover piece of the equation really comes in handy here. Because, I mean, take mm. a look at who's buying these, right, or looking to buy them, potential candidates, Amazon, Apple, uh, Nike, Disney. You Never heard of them. Never heard of them. Never heard of them. No, they're like huge. I don't see I mean, Disney doing it. Do you? <laughs> But, but just to, I, that the handful of companies that might be interested, yeah. like I can just imagine some of those conversations. I mean, these are mega players. They are, but I, I still have a hard time seeing what the, what what the what this what the what the brand how, you know brand would operate independently. Uh, for Disney, you mean? Well, not or just for, for Disney, but for any of these companies. Yeah, I mean, look, it's well, a healthy chunk of change for a company like Adidas or for Nike, and I don't necessarily see it as being within the Amazon ecosystem. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's not just about the, you know, the, the product, right, or the app or the 2.8 million subscribers. It's about the health data that comes with it as well. And arguably, that might be its most attractive mm -hmm. asset because take a look at what Apple's doing, wearables, right? Same story mm -hmm. with Amazon. They're looking into fitness. Nike is an easy uh, kind of comparison because it goes into the whole fitness universe. I'm with you. I don't completely understand the Disney bid, but Disney has their hands on a lot of different things. So right. who knows? Um but yeah, I mean, I, the, right. at the end of the day, it comes down to a lot of the cash. Right. Apple, like, what if all of a sudden by acquiring them, they get a whole new base of Apple Watch users, Start right? Mandalorian themed, Mandalorian themed rides? <laughs> Any, anybody who can leverage a brand as well as Disney, if you think about what they do. Um, Creedy, great, great chart. And uh, appreciate your analysis. Creedy Gupta, markets correspondent at Bloomberg on the phone in New York City. Well, let's head for a check of world and national news. Denise Pellegrini is standing by. Hey, Denise. Hey there, and let's head up to Canada because Canadian lawmakers are now saying they are worried about the economic effects of disruptive COVID-19 demonstrations in the country. The busiest border crossing between the U.S. and Canada has become partially blocked by truckers protesting vaccine mandates. And Brian Platt, government reporter for Bloomberg News, telling us here on Bloomberg Business Week, the protests in Ottawa next to the parliament are crippling. This may have started as a trucker protest, but I can tell you it's a lot more than just truckers here. Most of downtown is completely shut down. Meantime, that border crossing, I mentioned the Ambassador Bridge between Detroit and Windsor will carries about 25% of trade between the U.S. and Canada. Some momentum among congressional staffers to unionize. The Congressional Workers Union would likely need lawmakers' approval, though, and West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, the spoiler, he tells reporters, it's tricky since taxpayer money is involved. I've always been a big supporter of the unions having a right to unionize. But when you're working for tax dollars and you're at will and pleasure, I come and I'm here at the will and pleasure of the people. They have a chance to change and things of that sort. So we got to make sure we're doing it, doing it right. My greatest thing is to have the best staff I possibly can to serve the people of West Virginia. 
All right, so that's Joe Manchin there. Meantime, New York Congressman Alexandria ocasio Totez says she supports the union effort, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has also expressed some support. The U.S. has seized about three and a half, three point six billion dollars to be exact in Bitcoin stolen during a 2016 hack of the Bitfinex currency exchange, and it is being described as the largest financial seizure ever. Two people have been arrested, according to the Justice Department and Global News, 24 hours a day in more than a hundred. 20 countries. I'm Denise Pellegrini, and this is Bloomberg. All right, Nance, thank you uh, for giving me Denise. Boy, man, sorry about that. Denise Pellegrini, I am such a creature of habit. Pavlovian, like Pavlovian. dog. I am a Pavlovian. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right, Denise Pellegrini. Separated at birth, you and I, Carol. <laughs> exactly. World of National News there, Denise Pellegrini. Uh, Neil Young and Spotify uh, separated. Yeah, it's a story that, that keeps going. Um, so there's some interesting data Or not here. separated. Well, <laughs> you right? Like yeah, it's... exactly. Well, people aren't separating themselves from Neil Young. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, more people are listening to Neil Young's music even after he left Spotify. Streamed up 38%, this according to uh, his music publisher. Yeah, Merck Mercuriatus, which is uh, a fund that owns 50% rights to Young's catalog, said interest in the artist's music, music excuse me, has surged since he requested the streaming service remove his songs after accusing Spotify's most popular podcaster, Joe Rogan, of spreading vaccine misinformation on his show. I mean, you see this happening, right? Like, it's, yeah. if I don't know whether it's the Kennedy Senator Honors or American Idol or but when it's it also used the to name in the news. Like, You're like, oh, I want to go back and listen to Harvest Moon. I haven't listened to that in a while. Like, you just start playing. We just watched Respect, so I went and Googled like some older. Aretha Franklin, like you just start to do that kind yeah. of thing. I, I think it'd be difficult to connect it to support for Neil Young's position. That's what I'm, that's what I, that's my takeaway. What's interesting though, Neil Young, uh, he, he apparently isn't done. He appears to be driving another stake in the ground. Musician calling on baby boomers, uh, his crowd, to ditch the companies contributing to the mass fossil fuel destruction of Earth and proceeded to encourage people to take their money from J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. Here's a quote. He said this uh, in a post on his website uh, yesterday, or is dated yesterday. Join me as I move my money away from the damage causers or you will unintentionally be one of them. Yeah, this is really interesting, Carol. His criticism of the streaming service uh, and uh, of the banks, right? He's, he's using his position right now to try to push for social change. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know the alternatives that people have, but... We'll go back to the 60s, right? The roots of all of this. Yeah. And, and the musicians who were out there fighting for causes and changes, and, you know, changes did result. So you do wonder uh, where this might lead. Anyway, Neil Young definitely speaking up and people checking out his music.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg World Headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. Just about session highs right now on the Dow. Right to the numbers up 365 right now on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Higher by 1%. S&P up 34. Close to session highs up 8 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ holding on to a gain of 166 points up now by 1.2%. Broad-based rally underway. Gains in cyclicals and small caps signaling improving investor confidence in the growth outlook amid monetary tightening. S&P recovering ground lost in yesterday's late day slide led by financials and materials. We do have the Russell 2000 up now by 1.65 percent. Dow Transport's up by 2.1 percent and the SOX that is the Philadelphia Semiconductor Stock Index it is up now by 2.2 percent. Spot gold up a four tenths of one percent 1827 the ounce West Texas intermediate crude down 1.9 percent 89.55 a barrel. Ten-year treasury yield climbing to 1.95% levels last seen in 2019. Briefly, Microsoft is in talks to acquire cybersecurity research and incident response company Mandiant. That, according to sources, Microsoft up 1.1%, Mandiant surging now by 19.6%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much for that update, Charlie Pellet. It's 348 on Wall Street. The following is an editorial from Bloomberg Opinion. By all appearances, the situation over Ukraine remains dangerous. Although Russia continues to deny any plans to attack, President Vladimir Putin has massed troops and weapons on Ukraine's borders. The U.S. has responded by sending troops to bolster NATO's eastern flank. Still, despite the tensions, there are glimmers of a way out. Confronted with a surprisingly strong and united Western response to his moves, Putin has signaled some willingness to entertain talks on Russia's security concerns in Europe as a possible path to defusing the crisis. While not bowing to Putin's more extreme demands, President Joe Biden and European leaders should seize the opportunity to find common ground, particularly on matters such as military transparency and arms control. There's no guarantee Putin will respond positively to these overtures, but arms control diplomacy has worked before. It could help calm the world again. This editorial was written by the Bloomberg Opinion Editorial Board. I'm David Shipley. For more Bloomberg Opinion, please go to Bloomberg.com opinion or OPI and go on the Bloomberg Terminal. This has been Bloomberg Opinion. I'm driving in my car. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive, sing it, crazy. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. It's that punk to music will drive us until the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. Oh my God, it's a confusing day. Uh, we are just about 10 minutes away from the closing bell, and we have definitely seen stocks um, higher for most of the day. We did see kind of a turnover and just coming off uh, the, the highs, but uh, here we are once again, and we're just kind of bouncing around near our best levels of the day. Outperformers, you heard from Charlie, really the NASDAQ, up more than 1%. Let's, let's bring in Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist at LPL Financial. He joins us on the phone from Charlotte, North Carolina. Ryan, I, I love when you join us because you have so many technicals that you're looking at. At. Here we are, uh, you know, at the beginning of February still. Uh, give us an idea technically how you're uh, analyzing the market right now. Yeah, Tim and Carol, thanks for having me back. But, you know, the way we're putting it is this. What we're telling our advisors, this is a midterm year. We all know that, right? Historically, when you look at the four-year presidential cycle, guys, you know the most volatile out of the four? The midterm years. You see almost a 17% peak to trough correction during a midterm year. Did we expect it to be like, you know, the 10% correction to start this year in the S&P and even more in small caps and other areas? Well, probably not that soon at the start of the year, but it shouldn't be shocking to people uh, that we're having more volatility uh, right now. Now, the truth is we, you know, a couple Mondays ago was that the low right we had the record volume all the put the call ratio spiked a lot of fear we think we're carving out a bottom we had about a 10 percent correction in the s p here um you know we could maybe go back down and test it from a technical point of view but the truth again is this market just kind of seems like it's choppy and wants to kind of just bide its time here it's not necessarily bearish maybe not super bullish either but that's not the end of the world after the rally we saw last year so wait 
So you're blaming midterms historically, technically? Well, we wouldn't say we're blaming them. We're just pointing out, Carol, that historically midterm years are volatile. Let's not forget 2018, right? We saw a bear market in pretty much in 2018 late in the year. But at the same time, other reasons expect a little more volatility. The Fed is starting to hike rates. We've seen volatility. Wait, when wait, the wait. Fed can the technician talk rates. fundamentals? Mm -hmm. Can the technician talk fundamentals? I'm just wondering. Yeah, you know, I use the F word sometimes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm Whoa, okay. All right, so a technician. It's a technician joke. I know, I know. I, I can tell. So, wait, yeah. so talk to us a little bit more about, though, how you thinking. You must look, mm -hmm. like you said, you have to roll mm -hmm. in it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's, let's look back the last time the Fed hiked rates, right? We remember December, or started to hike rates, I should say. December of 15 had a pretty big sell-off into February of 16 as you recalibrate kind of the expectations of those hikes. You know, everyone's talking, oh, four hikes, five hikes, and we're not minimizing it. But the truth is, when we've looked in history, Carol, when you do that first rate hike in a new cycle, you know mm -hmm. what the S&P does? Goes it goes up. up 36 more months on average and gains like 70%. So just because the Fed is hiking, you're probably more mid-cycle, and there could be, you know, a good amount of time left. Investors need to remember that as we uh, start to see some rate hikes. So you've got midterms increasing volatility. You've also had a correction. Stocks do well after correction. Yep. Stocks do well in a rising rate environment. Having said that, Ryan, you know, mm -hmm. I love looking at technicals and I love looking at historical patterns, but this is a pattern too. We're coming out of a pandemic. Most of us yep. have never seen this before uh, and have right. lived through it. So there's still a fair amount of questions. No, you, absolutely, Carol. I mean, you're talking about questions. I mean, just look at those sentiment polls that we've seen, right? We've seen a lot of people are questioning what exactly is going on and that fear that comes. But again, you know, what patents say when, you know, if everyone's thinking alike, somebody isn't thinking. We are optimistic that, again, we've had all these bearishness coming in because so many people have been hit hard by, by this vicious, vicious correction to start the year. And there's still opportunities. I mean, you know, if all you looked at were financials and energy, and I know there's more stocks than that, but I mean, energy is unwell, financials are still strong. Look at these banks. Stocks. A lot of bank stocks are just now breaking out above where they were in 2007, 2008. It's hard for us to be bearish, the global economy, to see that leadership. And we've, I've called on you guys for a while, saying so we like cyclical value. Well, financials and energy have done well this year, and we still think cyclical value, this point in the cycle, makes a lot of sense to uh, continue to outperform a little bit here. Okay, uh, back to fundamentals. Just because we have you, we cannot ignore the inflation print that we're getting Thursday morning, 7.3%. Right is what economists surveyed by Bloomberg anticipate. Uh, how should investors read a potential upside or downside surprise? Yeah, well, it's going to be a big number, Tim. I mean, that's obvious. I think the way the investors should look at it is the reaction, right? What's the 10-year yield do on it? What do stocks do on it? But the truth is this. The 10-year yield is still not above 2%, maybe since we started talking it is. But, you know, <laughs> if the market was truly worried about massive inflation, I think gold would be way above 1,800. I think the 10-year yield would be way above 2%. It's not. Um, I think we're more optimistic than how strong this earnings season has been. What's corporate America say, right? What's the CEO yeah. of GM just say a week ago? He said, hey, listen, we see uh, full production in the second half of this year and improvement in supply chain. To me, that matters more for the average investor than the scary headline we're going to see on Thursday, which the politicians are going to play up. That's how it works. But investors need to focus on earnings are still strong. Global earnings, my goodness, global earnings are really strong. That's a, that's a positive thing for investors to remember. Right. Watch that bottom line. Um, but what's interesting, too, is we've got to watch margins and margin compression, because that's certainly something that investors are keeping an eye on. Hey, I think one of the indicators as a technician that you're really leaving out is the Super Bowl indicator. <laughs> yeah, don't invest in this, right? We've got to have that disclaimer. But historically, guys, uh, the, the winner of the Super Bowl, if it's from the NFC, the stock market's up for the year like 79% of the time. AFC, when the AFC wins, only two-thirds of the time. Now, I am a, I'm am from Cincinnati. I'm a Bengals fan. So yes, what does that that's mean? what I like the, to hear, Ryan. Today. Now, listen to this. Ten of the last 11 times an AFC team has won the Super Bowl, the S&P 500 was higher. So go Bengals, and that should be good for stocks. Don't invest in that, but I hope the Bengals win. Leave it at that. <laughs> I do, too. That's one thing yeah. we can all agree on, I think. Well, I think, it, we I think it just speaks to the, the moment in time, right? There's so many things that we can kind of point to to maybe kind of get an idea of what comes next. But, I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, it will be down to what the Fed does, whether they kind of get it right, um, yep. massaging those calls, and how earnings react ultimately, and what kind of economic growth, or do we ultimately fall into some kind of recession, even if it's a quick one, and what that can do certainly to the financial markets. 
No, you're right. Let's not forget this economic cycle of growth is almost two years old. It'll be two years old here in a couple months. Your average cycle of growth usually lasts five years. So I'm not saying this one couldn't fall into recession soon. We just don't see it. With the consumer this strong, 70% of GDP, the consumer is still pretty healthy, out there spending, out there getting jobs. I mean, they're quitting their jobs. I think it's hard to think millions of people to quit their jobs if they weren't comfortable about the state of the economy to go find a new job or create a new job. And likely, you know, usually small businesses and, and the consumers are right about the economy more right. than the, the uh, economists are. So we're going to trust them, and then that should still mean the cycle has probably a couple more years left of growth left, too, in our opinion. We shall see. Ryan Dietrich, thank you so much. Chief Market Strategist at LPL Financial on the phone from Charlotte, North Carolina, giving us certainly a lot to think about. Just a few minutes left in trading, and we're just off our highs of this session, so up more than uh, 1% on both the Dow and the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 just up about 9 tenths of a percent. It is time to head over to our Bloomberg TV team for Beyond the Bell, live on Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg TV and YouTube, our cross-platform coverage, counting you down to the closing bell on this Tuesday. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic, Caroline Hyde, Taylor Riggs, counting you down to that closing bell, here to help take us beyond the bell. It's our global simulcast partners, Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic, bringing together all of our audiences across Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. And Carol, we started off the day relatively weak here. Uh, we actually saw a lot of bidding come in, maybe around the 11 o'clock hour, and we've continued to drift higher as we have closer to the closing bells. I always find it interesting when we're seeing some buying, certainly into the close. So uh, I always think that shows and points to some strong strength in buying that investors are willing to step up uh, to wrap up a trading day and wait for the next one to begin, Tim. Yeah, we're expecting Chipotle, Mexican Grill, and Lyft after the bell, Uber among others tomorrow. Uh, an update on the earnings scorecard from our friends at Bloomberg Intelligence. 74.9% of the companies that have reported earnings thus far in the S&P 500 they've beaten. This is the smallest percentage going back to uh, the first quarter of 2020. Yeah, and when, you're, when you don't beat or you see slowdown in growth, boy, are you punished. And interesting that, again, the likes of Meta just not catching a bit on the day for I mean, the amount of value eroded since their earnings. Yeah. We continue not to see anyone wanting to wait in there. Yeah, and I, I still find that fascinating. I mean, we're now, what, four days? I mean, we had that big 27% drop, 26% drop mm -hmm. last Thursday and three straight days. And no one's, I mean, you've seen... So the, the sort of poke into the grain, yeah. but it hasn't been able to hold that. It was interesting, Matt Maley over at Miller yeah. T-Back, he always folds in some of the great technical analysis with the fundamentals. And Carol, really talking about if the fundamental story hasn't changed and there really has been the re-rating, you could get a quarter or two of this sort of lull that we've had until you get some real impetus for change. Speaking of technical analysts, Ryan Dietrich of LPL Financial saying that historically the S&P yeah. 500 does better when the NFC wins. So just something <laughs> ahead of the Super Bowl. Go Bengals. Bowl. <laughs> All right, Carol, hold your Remy Martin for one second here as we get the closing bells. In New York, the Dow Jones Industrial Average looks like it's going to finish the day higher by about 1%, 367 points or so. The S&P 500, which again opened pretty weak, uh, going to finish the day higher by about 8 tenths of a percent. And we should point out above, uh, just let me double check, above that 200-day moving average, that's kind of been like a magnet point here, but it's going to close slightly above that. The NASDAQ composite, the NASDAQ 100, still below their 100, their 200-day moving averages, but higher here on the day by about 1.3%. And the outperformer on the day, Carol, that's the Russell 2000, higher by about 1.6%. Yeah, watching that small cap outperformance. S&P 500, we're going to dig into the uh, major industry groups in just a moment, but 381 names in that index higher for the session, 123 lower, Taylor. Well, and it is clearly more tilted to the upside than the downside, Carol, as you mentioned, when you're talking about some of the sector levels as well. This is sort of the second subsector that we do here for our radio audience within the S&P 500. A lot more red, green, than there is red. You're starting with the hardware equipment right? Semiconductors, technology is in there. Banks are also in there too, as you've really continued to talk about rates uh, rising as well. So that's up about 1.9%. We'll go quickly to the bottom of the screen. There are a few sectors in the red. A lot of this is energy, utilities. That could be a rate story, though. Remember, energy, even though it's off 2% today, you're up 25% or so from the year. Really, the commodities boom that is underway is real. Real estate and sort of some of the biotech, uh, Carol, rounding out some of the nations. 
negative action on the day. All right, so let's get to some of the specific earnings uh, news that certainly has impacted some of the stocks and just some of the uh, stories. <laughs> let's try that again. Let's get to some of the gainers. I'm thinking about the earnings coming out after the closing bell. Peloton Interactive, it's up uh, about 51% in the past two days, up another 25% in today's session. We know the story. We've all been talking about it. Quite a rally. John Foley is out as CEO. He was the founder. They've got a new CEO. We're still waiting to hear to see if ultimately a company buys them out. Uh, and this is despite the company cutting lots of workers, cutting their forecast for full year revenues and subscribers. Stock that we know was way, way down. Amgen, I want to mention that. Top of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. Their 2022 revenue forecast did miss the average analyst, but a lot of analysts uh, came out and they liked what the company had to say about longer term growth prospects. I should also point out that they plan a 2020, 2022 buyback of about 6 to $7 billion. So that's a theme that we see a lot with companies and certainly propped up the stocks. We mentioned small caps doing well. I want to mention one, Society Pass, SOPA is the ticker. No real news, high short position, so this could be a short squeeze, but this stock was up almost 43%. Mind you, it's about a $4 stock. All right, you got the gainers, Carol. I got the decliners. Let's start with meta platforms. We were talking about this, Caroline, earlier, down uh, more than 2.1% today, still looking for that bottom, fourth day of declines in a row. In a row. Since that big decline of 27% in the last four days, now it's down close to 32%. So we'll see what tomorrow holds for the company. Have we looked at like the, the big drawdown, like sort of the maximum drawdown that we've seen on Facebook over the years? Because I'm curious. I mean, I'd be interested to see that data because the weakness on this for a third or fourth day is just kind well, of astonishing. That first day was the biggest in company's history. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, the four day in a row, I, I don't yeah. know off the top of my head, sure. but yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's just a question of when is the, when, where's the bottom here? Yeah, yeah. post IPO was pretty ugly, but. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, let's talk a little bit about Pfizer as well. The company reported earnings after the bell, or before the bell, I should say. Uh, it missed, uh, for the forecast, uh, the average analyst estimates down 2.8%. Moderna shares uh, moving lower on that news as well, down 4% for the day. Let's go across that side, because also what's down on the day, again, is actually oil pulling back a little bit. This is, we, of course, see this ongoing narrative across your are looking in the commodities vertical for your global macro move is a sea of red. Even though we still see on the day, of course, aluminium surging to the high since 2008. We had iron ore smashing $150 as Beijing is easing some of the steel's green targets. But really, this is a narrative of Brent crude up by 1.7%, WTI crude up by 1.8%, as we think maybe supply could come back from Iran. Maybe we're dialing down some of the concerns that we originally had about Russia and Ukraine. So keep an eye on commodities as we pull back that little bit. What that means for your FX vertical, because Norwegian Chrome therefore pulls back as oil pulls back. You saw the Canadian dollar, the loonie, off by three-tenths of a percent as well. But really, this was a risk on tone to the market. You see the dollar rally on the back of higher yields. You see the Japanese yen off by four-tenths of a percent. It really has been a global story. I know that we're awaiting earnings in just about 30, 40 seconds. So we'll talk quickly about yields before we get to the horse race of that. This is incredible. You're at a 19577. It's looking at a 196 on the 10-year yield. Really, as we're thinking about a global reflationary story for the second day, as we talk about where, how far and how fast we've come for this week, maybe further repricing. I would note that the, what does WIRP now say? About 40 basis points or so for March. Uh, yeah. Many analysts don't think that we'll get there but these are significant moves, at least on the front end as well. Yeah, and I just wanted to go back uh, really quickly to Facebook because I did just look uh, using the Bloomberg terminal, the drawdown. I mean, we're now something more than 40% off that all-time mm. high. That actually isn't as bad as that 2018, 2018 drawdown uh, during all the privacy scandals here. Mm. Yeah, of course. Keep a close eye on yeah. some of those continuing fallers. Keep an eye on tech when we got the earnings. Lyft, fourth quarter active riders, 18.7 million. Mm. That's a miss. The market wants to see 20 million active riders. Remember, of course, this is as we have ha had it way down by Omicron, people not wanting to get out quite as much as we'd seen previously. Their revenue, 969 million overall. That's a beat, though, of 940 million, which was the estimate. So seeing revenue pick up, but the active ride is not as strong as we've seen, and loss per share still there, $3. I mean, this is a company that, of course, is so eaten in from a rev from a profitability perspective, Remain, because yeah. while well, they're having to lure in more drivers, yeah. and we're all paying up that little bit more I, for I, our rides. I wonder what we make of the, the sort of myths on active riders. Mm. Is that sort of a reflection of Omicron and the idea that we all came back to work, and then, what was it, like November, December, everyone went back home? Yeah. 
because yes, everyone exactly. was scared to go leave the house again? I mean, active risers, year on year, were still up 49%. Mm -hmm. They just weren't getting to where the market wanted to see it. They are making more revenue per active rider was also mm -hmm. climbing year on year. But you've got to remember what sort of space we were in in fourth quarter of 2020 and how that compares. I mean, we're pleased to say that Mandeep Singh's with our senior technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, who has far more perspective on really Lyft is the pure play, as Taylor was telling us. This is the ride sharing, plain and simple. I haven't got the affectation of whether or not you're ordering your dinner through it, too. Is it the place to be as we go into the first quarter and we stop worrying about Omicron so much? Yeah, well, clearly it's a reopening play, and the active rider number was a miss, but you are going to see that, uh, you know, go up simply because they're going to go back to the pre-pandemic levels. The question is, how much runway is left lost. beyond, you know, 2022 and 2023? Mm -hmm. Because they are going to get back to the pre-pandemic levels. They're not getting market share from Uber. So right now it's a duopoly, but there isn't any share shift, and Uber is a scale player. So yeah. I think that's the question that investors will be asking. What, what is growth for this company? What does that even mean right now? Well, so growth would be mid-30% uh, going forward. You yeah. know, uh, this was an easy comp year right. going forward. But, but, I mean, yeah. where, but, I mean, where do they get that? I mean, do they just expand in the urban areas that they're already in? Do they expand into new markets? Where does that come from? Yeah, so right now it's based on uh, the domestic, uh, getting back their active riders, mm -hmm. the level they were at pre-pandemic. They are not expanding into new geographic markets, mm. and that's where I, I think that, uh, there will be a question mark around their sustainability of the growth. It's interesting, Mandeep. There's nothing in the press release outside just sort of the numbers, nothing about the expansion into new markets. We're not hearing anything about a labor shortage, a driver shortage, any regulatory headwinds. Were those not also a focus for you? Will that be on the call? Well, so clearly they are able to pass some of those cost increases to the customers. And that is uh, what is driving this top line. They're not there uh, yet in terms of the number of rides, but in terms of bookings, they have achieved those pre-pandemic levels. And part of that has to do with the fact that they can increase the prices and pass it on to the customers. Hey, man. Now, in my mind, it is hurting their volume growth. Hey, man, Deep, you know, just real quickly, you know, they start off their press release that they put out, the company, and they talk about the new CFO who came from Amazon Studios. We're talking uh, about Elaine Paul. They put that front and center. What does this CFO need to do or what does she bring to the company? Well, honestly, I was surprised, you know, their uh, previous CFO uh, went for a, an open C, you know, which is an NFT marketplace. To me, that's always, uh, you know, something uh, telling you about, you know, what he thought about the prospects. And look, they brought somebody from Amazon. It's a marketplace business. But at the end of the day, this company has to find new avenues for growth, whether it's B2B partnerships, uh, that's where Amazon experience can help. And uh, given they're not expanding geographically, at the end of the day, you know, the sustainability of the growth will depend on uh, either taking market share or expanding, you know, in, into new markets. Yeah, I mean, Deep, I want to go back to pricing power here. How much pricing power does Lyft have, especially in a duopoly where Lyft and Uber, if they are the only games in town, they could actually raise prices pretty significantly, right? Yeah, so look, I, I, I think there has been pricing rationalization. That has, that's how they have been framing it. And they're not uh, you know, competing no. in terms of price when it comes to uh, food delivery, what we have seen on the food delivery side. So clearly, I, I think this is a stable market in terms of pricing. And what we have seen is the volume is coming back. But uh, airport rides, for example, are still way below the pre-pandemic level. So clearly, there are drivers for the next year and you know the next four or five quarters. But we don't know what will happen beyond 2023. Mandeep, always great to get your expertise drilling into all things. Lift Manip Singh, Senior Technology Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. And Tim, we got some more earnings. Uh, yeah, we're getting Chipotle earnings, fourth quarter earnings per share coming in way below expectations. Uh, or I should say way, way below what they did year over year. Fourth quarter comp sales uh, up 15.2%, beating estimates of 14.8%. Fourth quarter revenue uh, up to, uh, to $2 billion, beating estimates of $1.96 billion. Fourth quarter operating margin uh, coming
coming in below estimates, 8.1% versus estimates of 9.88%. Fourth quarter adjusted EPS uh, coming in at $5.58. So that above estimates of $5.28. Yeah, comp sales, always an important metric, up 15.2%. So that's a beat, 148 This is a company that has pivoted big time over the last couple of years, yeah. moving aggressively into digital. They're also seeing 2022 new restaurants, 235 to 250 The estimate was 231 uh, remain. So yeah. uh, continuing to grow. And just real quickly, I mean, in the release, they talk about some of those inflationary pressures. They specifically single out beef and freight. And then they say, Tim, to a lesser extent, avocado costs, saying that that's actually been more than offset <laughs> from, well, offset by menu price increases. Mm -hmm. right. Rice which and power with that yeah. guac. Which is Bring something. Bring back cauliflower rice. <laughs> 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 All right, let's see what Mike Halen has to say. He covers the restaurant group for us here at Bloomberg Intelligence. He's senior restaurant analyst at uh, BI. So, Mike Halen, uh, the numbers just crossing. We're seeing shares of Chipotle rally big time in the after hours, up more than 6%. What jumps out at you? Yeah, I think that rally is is kind of a relief rally. Um, you know, we've seen the share share sell off about 25% since, since September. I think the street was expecting pretty significant margin pressure, with which we saw. Um, but you're seeing a little bit of a snapback rally. Um, you know, which really sticks out is that operating margin at about 8%. That's, that's significantly lower than... Uh, management was kind of intimating and uh, what the street expected, um, you know, and, and, and there's going to be a tough time. January is going to be tough because of Omicron, right? I, I, I'd expect them to say that hours of operations were kind of cut uh, due to employees uh, being out sick. Um, you know, uh, the, right. the restaurant industry numbers we had in January had definitely decelerated a little bit from December. Uh, and then we're going to start to lap significant stimulus payments from last year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, with with inflation, you know, high single digit food inflation and mid single digit labor inflation stacked on top of it, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of headwinds here in the next couple of quarters. Well, I want to go to the pricing power question here, given that wages are getting higher and, of course, the inflationary pressures that the company refers to in its earnings release. How much pricing power does the company actually have to pass those customers to pass those prices on to consumers uh, or are they absorbing it and getting hit on margins? Yeah, we're going to have to dig a little bit more into uh, how much of that same source sales uh, increase was traffic, right? Because um, that's a good sign. You know, if you can continue to generate positive traffic, that that's, uh, you know, tells me that they have some pricing power. And, and with the fact, you know, as strong as their same source sales have been over the last couple of years, you know, we do think there is pricing power. But to that point, they've raised prices pretty aggressively. You know, there was a double digit price increase around delivery orders. Uh, about a year ago, uh, last year in the fourth quarter, they raised prices again. So they've been aggressive because they do have some pricing power. We'll see, um, you know, how much they can increase prices with, uh, you know, the economy maybe slowing a little bit and, and consumer spending uh, expected to be down versus last year. Michael, the mix between the push into digital, meeting the customer where they are at their convenience, and yet in the press release talking about how there can be at least 7,000 Chipotle restaurants in North America. This is up from our prior goal of just 6,000 restaurants. And talking about accelerating unit growth of 8 to 10% a year and really shoring up their real estate pipeline, how are we thinking then about a real estate footprint as well? Yeah, so what's interesting is is they want more sites with Chipotle lanes. Yeah. Um, they they generate huge AUVs, average unit volumes for the for the chain, and uh, very attractive returns on investment. Uh, the issue with those sites right now is that they're in such high demand. You know, since the start of the pandemic, quick service uh, has absolutely knocked the cover off the ball, and, and we're seeing aggressive growth. Uh, you know, it, in the throughout the entire quick service segment, so. Uh, there is a lot of competition for those sites. Those sites are definitely more expensive than some of the uh, inline and, and strip center type locations. So, uh, you know, we'll see. But, you know, this isn't a surprise. I mean, as, you know, same source sales increase, that, you know, increases the potential locations uh, domestically here for the chain. All right. Good analysis. We really appreciate it. Mike Allen, he's senior restaurant analyst uh, and senior research uh, analyst uh, at Bloomberg Intelligence covering uh, those Chipotle earnings. That stock, by the way, up about 6% in the after hours. Lyft is our other earnings story. It is down 3%. So two different stories, guys, here. Yeah, but both suffering some sort of labor cost inflation, but some able to pass it on, some not. Whether or not we can stomach any more cost inflation on your burrito, I don't know. But for Definitely now, it looks as burritos. though... Do you think Carol eats burritos? Carol's never had a burrito. 
I love Mexican. Really good Mexican. What's not to love? No. How about you and I go get some co uh, cognac and uh, uh, some chipotle? No, I'm all for that. Yeah, you can Absolutely. put cognac. I think. I think. You don't have to ask me twice. <laughs> and definitely, isn't that one thing Contro really goes into is a margarita? So exactly. enjoy, guys. All right, done. That's a field trip. All right, that's going to do it for our cross-platform coverage on TV, radio, and YouTube. We'll see you again, same time, same place tomorrow. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. Well, you, you talked about Lyft moving lower in after hours. Uber reporting earnings after the bell tomorrow. Uh, also moving lower, down by about six-tenths of one percent. Oftentimes, they do move in tandem. They have slightly different business models. Well, you know, Uber's much more of a global story than Lyft. Man, Deep the, also the talked about the, the B2B, right? That Uber's yeah. got good, you know, like we, you and I talk about Amex, right? You can limit, you know, you can connect miles, right? Yeah. Uber and Amex. Like they are getting good at B2B partnerships and alliances that helps broaden out their network. And me as a user thinking that there might be more benefits to being on this platform. Yeah, Lyft's got that, you know, they've got a corporate program as well. No, exactly. You know, it, it definitely doesn't have the same incentives as uh, Uber's does. Yeah, exactly. And again, this is just a reset of just... What is our world post-pandemic? And we're seeing kind of our, our movement back and forth. Anyway, Chipotle flying in the after hours up 7%. Lyft is down more than 3%. Well, Charlie Pellet has been keeping a close eye on all of this after hours activity. Hey, Charlie Pellet. Well, hello there. Update. Let's go ahead and reset here and perhaps recap. Chipotle reporting comparable sales for the fourth quarter that did beat the average analyst estimate, as Carol mentioned, up now by about 7%. Lyft also after the bell, Uber tomorrow, but Lyft reporting revenue for the fourth quarter that did beat the average analyst estimate. Lyft's fourth quarter active riders, though, eight 18.73 million estimates there, 20 million lift after hours, moving lower by 3.5%. Broad based rally on Wall Street today, gains in cyclicals and small caps, signaling improver, improving investor confidence in the growth outlook amid monetary tightening. Today we had the Russell 2000 up by 1.6%. SP, to put that in context, up 8 tenths of 1%. SP up 37 points. The Dow rallied 371, up by 1.1%. NASDAQ composite index up 178, higher by 1.3 percent. Did see some dip buying in big tech names like Apple and Microsoft that helped lift the NASDAQ 100 index. That index up today by 1.2 percent. Ten-year yield 1.95 percent. Spot gold up three-tenths of one percent, 18.26 the ounce. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil down two percent, 89.50 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie Pellet will go with me for Chipotle and, co and a cognac, too. right? In a heartbeat. Wh where did cognac come from yeah. at Chipotle? Well, we talked about Remy uh, Contro uh, earlier, the CEO uh, of the, uh, I think, America's Group. Uh, we were talking about his ability to raise prices. All right, next. Don't you listen to every word that we say? Uh, and who would <laughs> not? I'm, I'm just thinking about that cognac. You know, cognac and Mexican food goes so well. Yeah. Charlie's busy, though. He's got to do Boston hits all over the country. All right. All right, let's get to it. Charlie, thank you so much. Um, Valentine's Day, just around the corner. It's Monday, still not too late to do some ordering. Maybe flowers, chocolates, trip to Anguilla. Honey, are you listening? <laughs> on the former, we have a great guest. Christina Stemble is founder and CEO of Farm Girl Flowers. She joins us on the phone from Seattle. Christina, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Hey, give us an update on your business right now um, and, and, and where you are, hopefully coming out of the pandemic at this point. Oh, that would be great. I would love it. <laughs> yeah. um, we're not quite there yet, but um, we're really hopeful. Um, I'm looking forward to 2023 for that, hopefully. Um, we are going into uh, what we like to call our Super Bowl of the year. It's uh, Valentine's Day. Um, and Valentine's Day this year is falling on a Monday, which is one of the worst days possible for, uh, actually the worst day possible for it to fall on for delivery. Um, we don't have many locations that can deliver on Monday, we're not a big enough company to get a Sunday pickup for Monday deliveries, so it's definitely throwing a wrench into it for us. So but this means you're shipping on you're shipping on a Saturday, but it's kind of just the flowers are hanging out until Monday. We're shipping from different locations, different dates, but we only have one location that we can ship to to get there on Monday. The rest of them have to come on Friday or Tuesday, um, and you know, like it'd be like getting a Christmas tree the day after Christmas isn't isn't that great. <laughs> it's tricky. I think what I would say, I would rather like. Give me my flowers. Sorry. Ahead of time? Like Friday or Saturday. Like just begin the Valentine's Day celebrations early. It's just a day. 
Carol's going to start the I movement. I hope everyone's listening to you. Valentine's <laughs> weekend. Is, right? Like, I agree. Like, you know, you kind of do a nice lead up. So, honey, you get flowers on Saturday or Friday, and then maybe we have dinner on Sunday, and on Monday we, you know, stay home and do laundry because we got to work the next day. Like, I don't know how you do it. Um, supply chains, though, in general, how have you been dealing with it, Christina? Yeah, we're kind of dealing with it the same way that every industry is. We're, you know, trying to think outside the box and how we can, you know, not, you know, we can absorb some of the extra cost without passing it all on to the customers. But, you know, it's kind of a, a toggle. You know, we have to, um, our prices are higher this year. They have to be because, you know, everything costs more right now. Cardboard prices are up. You know, flower costs are, are about double right now for Valentine's Day of what they usually are. Um, so, you know, that that comes with the cost that we have to pass on to our consumers and are they are they are they dealing with it well or do, are you seeing maybe an impact on demand because of the cost we definitely are seeing an impact on demand um, especially when we're competing you know with grocery stores and things like that that we didn't used to compete with at that level because people are still working from home where they can pick them up on their own um, so it's it's definitely hurting us um, and I, I know it's hurting every industry and we're no different there's a ripple effect that I wouldn't have even thought of if I didn't know flowers you know with container mm -hmm. prices that bring your tubers and bulbs and seeds you know and all of that that filtered down um, to the end consumer unfortunately what about supply chain when it comes to planes because I know that's a really important part of, of the uh, fresh flower industry because some of the stuff is being flown from South America right Absolutely. Um, and lift space is really hard around holidays. Everybody needs it on, you know, the exact same day. Um, and everybody's shipping so many things now, more than just flowers. And, um, you know, I always joke about, like, I wish I were, so, you know, we were selling sweaters instead. that They could, be, you know, sit on somebody's porch for three days or be in a sorting facility late. Um, but we rely really heavily on on-time delivery. And we're also fighting Mother Nature with weather right now. So, it feels like kind of, you know, a, a snowball effect of so many outside conditions uh, playing against us. So we're, you know, and relying on luck a lot, like relying on hoping that there's not going to be more snowstorms like last week, this week, um, and that the lift space holds out and we actually get what we've been told from our shipping partners. So, you know... <laughs> During the holiday shopping season, right, we always talk about Black Friday because that's traditionally the reason it's called Black Friday is when retailers would go from being in the red to the black. Valentine's Day, financially, how pivotal is that for you guys? It's one of the big two. Um, we really rely heavily on Valentine's Day and Mother's Day to help get us through the slow period, which is the summer months. Mm -hmm. June through September are, you know, everybody's spending, you know, usually spending uh, their money on family vacations and things like that. I'm not sure what it will be this year with COVID. Um, but, it, you know, definitely those two holidays in the, the first and second quarter help us uh, through the third quarter. So, you know, we rely on it a lot financially to, to carry us through the lumpiness of the, of the business. I want to go from supply chain to uh, corporate office and wages and get an understanding from you about how you've had to make changes during the pandemic and now how difficult it is to attract and retain talent. Have you had to raise wages significantly? Yeah, we've raised wages you know, significantly every year. Um, so I don't think COVID has really impacted that as much as a lot of other, other things. But, you know, we were operating in the most expensive area, you know, in San Francisco, which was probably not the smartest move <laughs> for me to make. Um, and we no longer are working in San Francisco. So that's helped us a lot. If we were still in San Francisco, I think we would see a lot more of that. Um, but retaining good talent is, is definitely something that's, that's hard to do. We, we really rely on our, you know, we have a great culture at Farm Girl, and um, that's helping us a lot that we have, you know, a team that just works, works their heart out, basically. And that's helped us um, a lot that people really care about the company and, and believe in the mission as well. Christina, I, I love what you do. Just, I think it's just gorgeous. Um, love the burlap, love it all. Um, I do have one quick question. We've got about 40 seconds left yeah. here. And I read somewhere in a recent story that about how you are, you know, foregoing growth opportunities in an effort to take on less risk. Just a quick thought on that. Because you could expand yeah, to other things, different products, but you're not. Just quickly your thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we may in the future, but the, the, the big risk this year for Valentine's Day was, you know, last year we took over a $5 million hit when over 50% yeah. of our packages weren't delivered on time, and we couldn't take that risk on again and almost put us out of business. So we're leaving a lot of money on the table by not taking as many orders as we could from riskier locations um, just to make sure that, you know, I'm not putting my team's you know, livelihoods at risk in their jobs. Well, it's an interesting way of thinking. We love talking with small business owners. Come back. We'll check in with you again. Uh, and good luck this Valentine's Day. Christina Stembel, she's founder and CEO of Farm Girl Flowers, on the phone from Seattle. I just, I love. $65 million company. Yeah. Massive. That's, 
That's pretty impressive. Yeah, very impressive. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masterton Stanovic will be right back. This is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. So I think it's safe to say that both you and I have had fun reading in for this next guest. Yeah, we really have. Joining us in just a few minutes is going to be Laura Turner Seidel, chair of the Captain Planet Foundation. She's going to join us from Atlanta. Um, there's a superlative with her home. She lives in the first LEED certified home uh, in the United States. LEED certified gold, I should say. Okay, right. There's distinctions, there's levels. Yeah. So we're going to get to her in just a moment and uh, talk about the Captain Planet Foundation and really the work that they're doing with a younger generation when it comes to our environment. First up, though, let's talk about our environment, the world of business with Charlie Pellet. And let's begin specifically with restaurants Chipotle Mexican Grill. It reported sales that topped estimates as smoke brisket, strong delivery orders, higher prices, all help results in the fourth quarter, shares higher in trading after our Chipotle up now by 7.6%. The other big report out after the close of trading, Lyft, based in San Francisco. Lyft reporting fourth quarter sales that beat analyst estimates, benefiting from higher prices due to a shortage of drivers. However, it reported fewer riders than expected as Omicron damped travel after hours. Lyft now lower by 3.6%. Big move higher for the U.S. stock market today with the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all gaining key takeaway broad-based rally, gains in cyclicals and small caps signaling, improving investor confidence in the growth outlook amid monetary tightening. Got to begin with the Russell 2000 up today by 1.6%, NASDAQ 100 index up 1.2%, NASDAQ composite index up 178 points, up 1.3%, S&P 500 index up 37 up 0.8 percent. Dow Industrials up 371, a gain there of just about 1.6 percent. Ten-year yield 1.96 percent today. Ryan Dietrich is chief market strategist at LPL Financial, and right here on Bloomberg Business Week, he told us nobody should be surprised by all of the volatility. You know, a couple Mondays ago was that the low, right? We had the record volume, all the put-to-call ratio spiked, a lot of fear. We think we're carving out a bottom. We had about a 10 percent correction in the S&P here, um, you know, we can maybe go back down and test it from a technical point of view. But the truth, again, is this market just kind of seems like it's choppy and wants to kind of just bide its time here. It's not necessarily bearish, maybe not super bullish either, but that's not the end of the world after the rally we saw last year. And worth repeating the 10-year, 10-year uh, Treasury yield up to 1.96% levels last seen in 2019. Again, we have got gold up three-tenths of 1%, 1826 the ounce West Texas intermediate crude down. 1.7%, 89.76 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Gotcha, gotcha. Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. So as we said, really fun reading in for this next guest, who last year told People Magazine that, quote, taking care of the environment, it's in her DNA. We so welcome Laura Turner Seidel. She is chair of Captain Planet Foundation, and she joins us on the phone from Atlanta. Laura, it's so nice to have you here on Bloomberg Radio. Um... Let's cut to the chase. Your dad, well-known, someone who changed the world of media, uh, blowing up the world of cable decades ago. We're talking, of course, about Ted Turner, who I believe also is a big, big, or one of the largest individual landowners in North America. Lots of uh, open land out west. Sees the environment, has been, the environment has been so important to him. What was it like growing up in that environment? Well, uh, thank you, first and foremost. Carol and Tim for having me on the program today. Sure. Um, it was kind of like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, he, he is a real life Captain Planet and he spent his career uh, on a top, a mountaintop of information and he saw a lot of what we're experiencing today uh, either firsthand or in you know reports coming in from around the world. Uh, about environmental degradation and pollution and, you know, potential for wars. And obviously he covered a lot of that on on his uh, his media platforms, including CNN. Um, we got into trouble for not turning the lights off or, or leaving the TV on when we left the room. Uh, he We drove around in a little Japanese car, you know, 
squished in. We weeded our lawn by hand on the weekends, and our neighbors would drive by. We'd wave to them. Um, our whole whole yard was weeds. That was really uh, to avoid using chemicals and or paying for expensive uh, maintenance. Um, when you have five kids, you've got a you know a, a, a pretty much a free labor force. What do you think your dad saw at a time when? people weren't really talking about the environment. I mean, we think back to even like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, right? He was thinking about these things before that. He sure was. Um, He was really concerned. Um, You know, Dr. Lester Brown, uh, there was the Global 2000 report that President Carter at that time commissioned that said, you know, humanity was racing towards disaster. Um, you know, that we were over consuming uh, the resources of the planet. We were not taking care of the systems that supported all life, our, our air, our water, our land, our soil, our climate. And, uh, you know, he really, you know, used his platform for good to educate people. Um, he, you know, aired underwater sea adventures of Jacques Cousteau and National Geographic Explorer to make people fall in love with nature and want to take care of it. But I would say one of his most important, uh, you know, parts of putting vision back into television was, um, you know, his focus on engaging, empowering, informing youth to be problem solvers and, you know, agents for change. Uh, for for our life support system, for their inheritance and their children's and grandchildren's inheritance, and uh, you know that it, it was his idea. He's like, mm-hmm. we need a superhero, but not just a superhero that goes around blowing things up, but actually a superhero focused on saving the earth. But what was great is the executive producer. Uh, Barbara Pyle came up with the idea that it really needed to be a, in conjunction with with young people mm. from around the world who would come together, and their youth really was their superpower. And um, if they worked individually and collectively uh, and smartly and wisely and strategically, they could change systems and uh, put pressure on governments, on business, uh, and, you know, really create a world that they, that they envisioned. And, you know, I, I just think, you know, in our 31st year of the formation of the foundation, uh, well, it, it's our 31st, last year was our 30th. Of course, we put everything off because of COVID, mm-hmm. uh, and we are hosting our first in-person gala in a couple of years, um, coming up in March. But, you know, I, I think that the, what he wanted to happen when he started that cartoon hey. has actually been happening right. all these years. And, you know, our... Laura, Laura, the, Laura forgive, yeah. hold on for a second because we have to do a little bit of news. And I, I want to just hold that thought and we'll come back and, and definitely continue with you because we want to hear a little bit more about his initial thoughts with it. We're going to come back to Laura turner Sadell of uh, Captain Planet Foundation in just a moment. In the meantime, a check of what's going on in the world of national news. Here's Denise Pellegrini. All right. Thank you. Well, Canadian lawmakers are warning about the negative impact of disruptive COVID-19 demonstrations. The busiest border crossing between the U.S. and Canada has become partially blocked by truckers. They're protesting vaccine mandates and government reporter Brian Platt telling us here on Bloomberg Business Week this could have a major impact on Canada's economy. It is a massively important bridge. It carries about a quarter of all trade between by land between Canada and the U.S. It, it's You can't overstate how important this, this bridge is uh, to um, land trade between the two countries. And Platt also says the protests in Ottawa have just about shut down that city. A New York couple is under arrest. The Justice Department is reporting its biggest financial seizure ever in the crypto space. More than three and a half billion dollars worth was seized, according to Justice, which says it was stolen during a hack of the Bitfinex currency exchange. A lot of mask mandates are being lifted. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont recommending the mandate be lifted in schools this month. New Jersey already moved in that direction. Delaware and Oregon and doing something similar. California is lifting the mask mandate for indoor public places next week. Vermont is a step closer to adding abortion rights to its constitution. 
And in Washington, President Biden announcing Australian electric vehicle company Tritium will be opening an EV plant in Tennessee. The president calling it one of the first steps to making the United States the leader in EV manufacturing. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Denise Pellegrini. This is Bloomberg. All right, Denise, thank you so much. Denise Pellegrini with World of National News. We've been talking with Laura Turner Seidel, uh, chair of Captain Planet Foundation, as we've been mentioning her father, of course, Ted Turner. Uh, Laura, we just have a couple of minutes, then we're going to do some more news, and we'll come back and talk for a, a longer conversation because we want to get back to Ca Captain Planet Foundation and, and the work yeah. that you guys are doing on the environment. But in terms of the media world and growing up with that, it has changed so dramatically. Um, your thoughts on media and the responsibility when it comes to climate change? Well, of course, there is a huge responsibility uh, to climate change. But, um, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, there are some, you know, companies that, uh, you know, are more concerned about profit uh, than people. And, and they're, they're willing to do anything to uh, support their companies and, you know, squeeze out every last little penny. Um, some companies are transitioning and trying to get on board, but uh, they control our media through the advertising and they control our politicians. And, you know, so it's really important that, uh, that you know, the public uh, puts pressure in the right places, and, and that's what I love about Captain Planet Foundation is that the youth now are putting pressure on the right places with a little bit of training, mentoring, support. Uh, you know, they can go out and they can be change agents, and mm -hmm. they're changing policies, and they're, get, you know, getting right. businesses. To, yeah. Well, I got to say... I have to say, just and we're going to come, we're going to do some news and come back in just a moment. But we were talking Cap Planet, and and I'm going to be fair, Tim. Be my, fair, Tim, my co-host, and one of our producers, Ari, they're like, oh my god, that's right, Ted Turner. We like, started singing Captain the Planet. Captain Planet theme song <laughs> during the break because you know they grew we, up with yeah, it. Yeah, early '90s. That's when we were kids. You were watching it. All right, we're going to come back to Laura Turner Seidel, chair of Captain Planet Foundation. We'll continue our conversation with her in just a moment on Bloomberg.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Chipotle Mexican Grill shares after hours up now by 8.3 percent. Chipotle reporting sales that topped estimates as smoked brisket, strong delivery orders, and higher prices helped results in the fourth quarter. Lyft reported fourth quarter sales that beat analyst estimates, benefiting from higher prices due to a shortage of drivers. However, it reported fewer riders than expected as Omicron damped travel. Lyft after hours down 5.4 percent. Tomorrow, we will be hearing from crosstown San Francisco rival Uber. S&P up 37 points today, up 8 tenths of 1 percent. Broad-based rally gains in cyclicals and small caps signaling improving investor confidence. Today, we had the Russell 2000 advancing by 1.6 percent. The Dow up 371, up 1.1 percent. NASDAQ up 178, a gain of 1.3 percent. Tenure down 13, 30 seconds. Tenure yield 1.96% right now on the 10-year, worth repeating, 1.96% there. Spot gold up three-tenths of 1%, 18.26 the ounce. West Texas Intermediate Crude down 1.6%, 89.87 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Uh, let's get back to our guest, Laura turner Seidel, uh, chair of Captain Planet Foundation, still with us on the phone from Atlanta. Laura, you were talking about the foundation. I think you're getting ready for a big uh, event. Tell us a little bit more about what's coming up. And, and I'm also curious, since you guys have been around for about three decades, I'm curious about the impact that you all have seen in working with a younger generation, especially when it comes to improving things for our environment, really our future, the existence of all. Well, yeah. <laughs> In, indeed, and, and I listened to your program with Catherine Hayhoe and understand you have a, a teenage daughter. I do. Uh, <laughs> I might want to check out uh, one of two events I was hoping to tell you about, um, obviously our gala coming up, but we just launched the Planeteer Alliance yesterday, so this interview comes at a really good time, and basically uh, it's Gen Z. Uh, came to us and said, you know, it's great that you're funding educators and then we're, you know, going through the program and working with them, but we want to work with you directly. We want uh, training, mentoring, resources, and a, and a platform to, uh, to organize and strategize and share best practices around the globe. And we've been perfecting this platform for the past five years. And it's really interesting. You know, we because of COVID, we had to pivot to everything virtual, which was a, a game changer and a blessing for the youth of this world because we were able to get, uh, you know, a couple thousand, uh, you know, youth to come to our trainings and, uh, and, and they're sharing, you know, peer to peer, they're teaching peer to peer. And these kids are going out and making such enormous change, like this Hawaiian, uh, Dyson T came to our boot camp. He was uh, he was an introvert, self-identified as an introvert and shy. And at the end of the boot camp, he said, "Okay, now I understand youth is my power. I've got the confidence. I've got the plan." And he went and stood up three campaigns. One, he shut down. He led a youth campaign to shut down the last coal fire plant in Hawaii. He um, is currently shutting down these uh, uh, military oil holding tanks that have been polluting wow. the water on a Oahu for 100,000 people. And, uh, you know, he, he just is absolutely brilliant and, you know, is, is getting it done. And there's just that case is not unique. There are so many of these hundreds of these youth that are standing up these campaigns. Chloe May, for instance, in California, um, got 325 schools to stop, you know, distributing plastic straws at lunch uh, because she went and talked to uh, about cost of, of these plastic straws that were going straight in the trash can. And, you know, so here she came to our training mm -hmm. and, and that's what the Planeteer, uh, the Planeteer Alliance is all about is like getting these kids the Gen Z and now uh, Gen Alpha to really um, look at a broad suite of, of, of uh, issues hey, that are facing them. 
you know, Laura, um, from, yeah. I'm wondering, you know, it's funny, Carol and I were both nodding along when mm -hmm. you explained to us that, you know, you got in trouble for leaving the TV on or turning the lights out because we both grew up in, in homes like that. And I'm wondering, in a world where companies account for so much of the pollution and, and other countries account for so much of the pollution in our world, what message do you have to people who feel like completely overwhelmed with the direction that our planet is going and, and what changes that they could actually make in their daily lives when it doesn't actually feel like, okay, separating you know, the trash from the recycling is actually making a difference? Right. Well, you know, we have to do everything in our power because, you know, we, it's like a lot of what we've heard and learned over the past couple of decades is that the climate change, the worst of it is coming in 2050. You know, that was, that was wrong information. We're seeing it play out before our very eyes now. Maybe we should pay more attention to what the youth are trying to do and think about when we make decisions of you know, what we buy and, and you know, how well, we consume and and, uh, and how we recycle and how we vote uh, and show up that uh, we're thinking about like the indigenous people did about the seventh generation. How do our actions today affect their health, their future, their quality of life? We haven't done enough of that. We right. you know, focus on fourth quarter earnings and uh, the next election, but we're not thinking about them. And, and, and that's just plain wrong. And my dad, you know, pay attention to what he has said all along. You know, the science is real. We need to take action. We need to figure out how we can engage in every way possible. Well, because you know what? Well, in the end, our kids are going to look us in the eyes, and they're going to hold us accountable. Laura, Laura just, just, I just want to jump in for a second. And, and I'm just curious, you know, if... In terms of agents of change, because you talked about agents of change failing us, just if you had to pick one quickly, you know, agent of change that could really make a difference with the climate, because you guys have been doing this for 30 years, and yet the trend lines when it comes to climate change, and, you know, the forces have been against everybody because it's just gotten worse. What's one agent of change that if you could flip the switch on, turn it off, <laughs> like our parents told us to do, what would it be? Okay, I, I, I've been involved with an organization called League of Conservation Voters. Go online, see how your legislators, both federally and, you know, and, and locally, vote on things related to the environment, vote on climate, on the climate crisis, and make sure that you're calling them and telling them to, uh, that it's important for them to, to pass the Build Back Better bill because there's a lot of money that uh, will help, uh, you know, with, to, to, to uh, come up with uh, solutions to the climate crisis. That's really, really, really important. And also find out what's important to your kids and figure out ways to plug into it. And there's so many amazing nonprofit groups uh, in, in our communities, you know, from uh, water keepers right. uh, you know, that need help, they need support, they need volunteers. Right. You know, gardening is really important in community gardens. We have school gardens that Captain Planet, you know, right. funded about 2,000 of them hey. and have a, 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 a learning garden program that gets teaches kids about what's important. Laura, uh, Laura, 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 I got to jump in. And I just, because we do only have like 30 seconds left here. There's a lot of people reaching out to me in social media saying, Ted Turner, our <laughs> thoughts are with him. How is your dad doing? Just quickly. You know what? He's doing really well under the circumstances, but so many people have Lewy body dementia, twice the number of people that have been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of people that have it that might not know about it, and I would suggest you go to uh, the Lewy Body Dementia Association, and if you have a loved one that is, uh, you know, coming right. down with signs of dementia, and watch Robin Williams, uh, the, yeah. the right. documentary right. Uh, about his struggle with Lewy Body Dementia. Well, but thanks for asking, and, you know, he's fighting yep. the good fight. And he's we get, Laura, we, we have to run, and I'm so sorry, but good luck with your event. Our best wishes to your dad. And you are all listening to Bloomberg.